Let's start lecture two with a small review of lecture one. So yesterday, we were studying the scattering of gluons, and we said that when you scatter n gluons, you have to specify data. You specify momentum, polarization vectors, and a color index for each particle. And there was a clever way of separating the color structure so that you only had to worry about the kinematics. And that's called the color decomposition. And we wrote it in a form that looked like this. where W is some permutation of n elements modulo cyclic transformations. These objects over here were called partial amplitudes. And we said that they satisfy some amazing properties. Well, at least they look amazing from their point of view, right? Because they don't know anything about color, but once you know about Lagrangian, you know that they have to satisfy some properties. As yesterday, we mentioned some of them. The first one is cyclicity. Imagine we have the partial amplitude with the canonical ordering. This has to be equal to this one. Okay, so it has to be cyclic in the labels. The second one, and today I'm not gonna try to spell it, I did it for you, the KK relations. So cyclicity tells us that from the n factorial independent ones, we go down to n minus one factorial, but KK were smarter and they said that you can actually bring any two labels, say one and n, to become adjacent by taking appropriate linear combinations. And I hope somebody tried to do it. So we had a formula like this. What's important is that they told us that any object of this form can be brought or can be written as a linear combination of amplitudes where one and n are adjacent to each other, and that brings n minus one factorial down to n minus two factorial. And the third property was the BCJ identities, which tell us that you can even do those, the same kind of procedure, but with a third particle. Here they chose one and two to be adjacent. After you use KK, you can bring one and two to be adjacent, and now you can use a further relation to bring three next to two. With some function that depends on the permutation and only depends on Mandelstam variables. That was the magic that this only depended on Mandelstam variables. I told you that these functions were complicated, but that these identities could all be derived from something called the fundamental. BCJ identity. And this is an identity of this form. So I want to get it right because we're gonna use it later on. So let me get it from here. So just so that everybody's on the same page, let me remind you that 
throughout this talk, SAB is the same as KA plus KB squared. KA, KA mu is zero because these are massless particles, and therefore this is always two times KA dot KB. Okay? So we have this identity exactly. Very good. So Yuji is a very good student. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You see? Yeah, actually the physical origin of BCJ is not is not very clear. So this is something that in 2008 they discovered. Later on it was realized that it can be derived from a string theory by taking vertex operators and moving them around the the boundary of a disk. Okay? So once you go around, you pick up a monodromy factor. When you expand that, you would think that only the real part, or only the alpha prime, the leading ordering alpha prime corrections, or sorry, the leading ordering alpha prime, we have a field theory interpretation. But it turns out that the leading order is a real object, and the imaginary part also can be shown to be independent of alpha prime. Or not independent, but it doesn't receive any higher order corrections from the effective action. So there is yet another identity, and that's the BCJ identity. Okay. The last thing we said, like yesterday, was that MHV amplitudes the formula discovered by, by Park and Taylor is tailor-made to satisfy these identities. So the formula has all gluons with plus helicity except for two gluons, say I and J, that have minus helicity. And this is a formula that you're, by now you're very familiar with. Okay. So this I and J is a little bit boring. Okay. The engine behind the triviality of all these identities, or how simple they look like, is actually this factor, which I would like to define as the part Taylor factor of one, two, up to n, okay? Just to simplify the notation. So I'm gonna call this the part Taylor one, two, all the way to n. So, A linear combination of these identities gives rise to the starting point that we had yesterday, which was called the U1 decoupling. And let me write it today in a slightly different form. It's exactly the same identity, but I'm gonna start from the end. Yesterday, I started with one position for the particle that I'm gonna move around, so today I'm gonna start from the end point. So I'm gonna put particle end between two between one and two, and you're gonna see why. And no, I'm not going to forget it, yes. <laughs> So that's the U1 decoupling identity, the one that tells you that if you're scattering n minus one gluons and you want to know the probability of producing a photon, that has to be zero. And we said that for MHV, this was easy to prove, so we use this formula. Remember, we can forget about this factor that's boring. So yesterday what we did was to say, well, let's factor out what everybody has, or what almost everybody has, and that was, a part Taylor factor of particles one, two, up to n minus one. So remember the definition, so I'm gonna write it for you again here. So we have one, two, two, three, up to n minus one, n minus two, n minus one, n minus one, one. And then we're going to put in here whatever I need to multiply this with to produce the corresponding one, okay? 
So I have this formula and I want to get this one. What do I have to multiply by to get it? Well, what I have to do is to multiply by, so in this formula, one and two are not adjacent, but this formula has them adjacent, so that's bad. So I have to remove that factor. This formula has a one n factor in the denominator, this one doesn't, so I have to put it in the denominator. And this one, likewise, okay? The next one, I do the same thing. And now you see why I reordered them. So yesterday, I wasn't very smart. But today, I am. So we go all the way to n minus 1, 1, n minus 1, n, and n, 1. And this thing has to be 0. I encourage you to prove this by a telescopic uh, argument. But I'm, I'm going to tell you today about my favorite, actually my favorite way of proving it. And this was actually done by Hodges in 2008. And what I'm going to tell you is not the paper that he wrote down. It's, I mean, it's just basically a footnote in his paper. So the paper is about something else. But the idea comes from there. So here is a deep identity we're going to use. Let me remind you, before we do it, that for any spinner, we can write it as a orbital factor. This is a two-component object. So we can write it as an orbital factor and one in the first component and ZA in the second component. And this identity now becomes an identity. See that the factors, the overall scale for factor two cancels out, the overall scale for the spinner three cancels out, and the only thing that appears here is the overall scale for n, but n is a common factor, so the overall scale factors out, and the identity becomes an identity between differences of complex numbers, or among differences of complex numbers. Okay, now I can tell you the trick. The trick is to realize that if you have ZA minus ZA plus one over ZA minus ZN, ZA minus ZN plus one, this is nothing but the contour integral in the complex plane Z. Imagine you have ZA here and ZA plus one here. Choose a path that goes from ZA to ZN plus one, and integrate this function. Now it's a double pole, so the path doesn't matter, right? You can deform the path in any way you want, even pass it through the pole, because the residue is gonna be zero, so no problem, okay? Now, let's write down the identity. So the identity tells us that we have to I start here, the first factor is the integral from C1 to Z2, right? The second factor is the integral from Z2 to Z3, Z4, and so on. And guess what happens? We're gonna close the contour. And when we close the contour, we deform it and we get zero. Isn't that nice? Okay. But this identity, or this way of proving it, also shows us something interesting, which is that if we start with any point here, say ZA, and we go to any point ZA plus M, okay, the sum, say of B from A to A plus M, of these factors is equal to the same, to the integral from here to here, but then I don't have to pass through the, all the points here. I can deform the contour and just go from A, from ZA to ZA in plus one. How appropriate. It ended up in the right place to be there, to be the upper limit of the integration. 
over z minus zn squared. And this is nothing but z a minus z a plus m over z a minus z n, z n a plus m. Okay, so we got ourselves nice, nice identities. Okay, so why are they important for us? Well, because they will allow us to rewrite this PCJ identity in a nicer way. And that's what I'm going to do now. So let's study the fundamental PCJ identity for park Taylor factors. Okay? Once again, I'm forgetting about the overall ij to the fourth. I don't care about that because it's not going to do anything interesting. So, again, I look at this sum and say, well, this sum looks pretty much like one of these U1 decoupling identities, but it's incomplete. You see that it doesn't go all the way around. It starts at b and it goes all the way to n minus 1. But can we use anything on the blackboard to simplify this problem? Well, exactly this identity here. Because the sum, so the fundamental BCA identity becomes SMB, B1 to N. And now this sum over here becomes the sum from A equals B to N minus 1. So let me write it. A, A plus 1. So I'm getting a little bit um, bored of writing Z and Z all the time. So let me introduce a convenient notation. Z A minus Z B is going to be just this. Okay? That will also save you some writing. Okay? Here, note that this a plus 1 is actually a number modulo m minus 1, okay? So don't worry when we get to a equals to m minus 1 that we're going to be in trouble because when you put it in here, you get 1. You don't get n, okay? So that's what the identity tells us or that that's what we want to prove, okay? But now using our identity here, we can resum each term and get something that looks like this. That looks pretty simple. It's just a sum over B of these factors. Now, this factor is trivial. It's a common factor, and we want to prove that this is zero, so we can cancel it out. Oops. Okay. I don't want to fall. That's good. All right, so we can cancel this out. Now we are ready to prove the identity. Let's go back to our spinners. We can multiply again by the scaling factors and bring this notation back to the angular bracket notation. And the identity we have to prove is that when we go from 1 to n minus 1, we multiply the Mandelstam variables, this spinner over Bn, this has to be equal to 0. Okay. So let's see, how many people were familiar or are familiar with this formula? Well, I wrote it down yesterday, but did you see it uh, in Simon's lecture? Well, if you haven't, know that this is the only Lorentz invariant possibility for this. Just, there could be an overall factor, maybe a factor of two or something, but it turns out to just be one. So you can try to work it out and show that indeed the factor is one. Okay, so we're gonna use that here and see why. 
because when we write SNB as that product, this factor cancels, so we get MB B1 from 1 to M minus 1, and this has to be 0. Okay, is this 0 now? Well, let me rewrite this in a spinner notation a little bit. So I'm going to write it like this. So this means that we have particle n, lambda tilde of particle n, alpha dot, this is the spinner index, contracted with the spinner index of particle b. Sorry, the in these two are contracted. And this one is now contracted with the spinner of particle one. Okay, But what is this object? This is a momentum of particle B. Okay, Now I can put the sum in and get And now we use the observation that somebody made yesterday that I told you we have it in our imaginations, but we keep it always in mind, which is that we're always dealing with something that satisfies this momentum conservation, and therefore the sum of all momenta is equal to zero, and therefore the sum of all momenta from one to n minus one happens to be minus the momentum kn. But if we have the momentum Kn contracted with a spinner lambda n, we get immediately zero. Okay? So that's the proof of the identity. Now I want to rewrite the identity a little bit. Actually, I'm going to take this form. And I'm going to do the following. Once again, these brackets indicate differences of complex numbers. So I'm going to write the numerator, which is ZB minus Z1, in a slightly different form. Sorry. Ah, not even Juji caught this because he's reading. <laughs> Don't worry. Okay. So I'm rewriting the identity slightly. The idea is that this factor now cancels with the denominator and gives me a sum over S and B from B1 to M minus 1 plus the next factor, which is Zm minus 1, comes out of the sum, and we get Smb over Zb minus Zn. Now, what is this? If you sum over all the particles from B to M minus 1, from 1 to M minus 1, note the definition of Sab which was kn dot kb. We can put the sum inside. If you put the sum inside, you get again km square, and this is zero. This is an overall factor, and we discover this new form for the BCJ identity. Know that this we discover by moving particle n. But if we move any other particle, it should also be true, right? So it must be true that if we sum from b to n and b different from a, sab over za minus zb, this must be zero 
for all A. Okay. Now I want to make a bold claim. And the claim is the following. That any rational function of some variables x1, x2, up to xn. Now, this could be independent variables or they could be sets of variables, okay? So x could represent many variables, but you have n of them, okay? That satisfies us. One and two, cyclicity and kk. So we have a function, one, two, up to n, of these variables, and the function satisfies that is cyclic in the permutation of the labels and satisfies this identity. Okay? Then it must be. It must be the algebraic transform of Park and Taylor. We all know, of course, what algebraic transforms are, right? No? Good, because I made it up. <laughs> okay, so let me give you the definition of this. So what I mean by that is that you take Park and Taylor in terms of the complex variables as Z, now let me change the name because it's gonna become useful in the future because we're not gonna be talking about spinners anymore, okay? So I'm going to change Z for sigma just to remind myself that I'm not talking about spinners. I'm talking about something more general than spinners, okay? So for me, Park and Taylor, from now on, if I say Park and Taylor of one, two up to n, this I take to mean the differences of sigmas, where the sigmas are complex numbers. Okay, so I'm introducing as many, dif as many different notations as possible so that I confuse you maximally, okay? So hopefully I won't succeed with that. So let's keep going. So we have this Park and Taylor. So what do I mean by the algebraic transform? The claim is that our function x1 and x2 up to xn is an integral over all these sigma variables of Park and Taylor of some product of constraints that relate the sigmas to the x variables using polynomials times possibly an integrand that depends on the axis and the sigmas, and this integrand is permutation invariant in the labels. And these constraints are also permutation invariant when you take them all at the same time. It's a list of constraints that are permutation invariant. These are delta functions. So Many of you should be wondering what the heck am I doing because I have integrals over complex variables and I have delta functions and they don't go together very nicely, as you know. But by this, what I really mean is poles, so we have denominators and we're doing a contour integral in a multidimensional space. But that's too long, so I prefer just to write delta functions 
and remember that I'm solving all these equations simultaneously, and I'm summing over all possible solutions. I don't care if they are real or complex, okay? So this is a claim that if the function satisfies that, then it must be of this form. So the contour is actually a sum of contours. It's a sum over n-dimensional tori, and I cannot say that they enclose the singularity because in more than one complex dimensions, you cannot enclose a singularity with the product of S1s, right? But each one of these guys defines a hyperplane, and then the TN, in a sense, encloses the union of these hyperplanes, okay? All of them, all of them. You might be worried because you would say, well, if you pick all of them, you can use a residue theorem. But remember that there is a factor here. So this is not zero. You cannot use what is called the global residue theorem because there is an extra piece that also has poles. So let me give you a more or a less complicated way of thinking about this, you solve all these equations, okay, find all the solutions, and sum over all the solutions, one over the determinant of the Jacobian of the matrix made out of this, times Park and Taylor, evaluated on the solutions, right? The solutions are values for sigmas that depend on the axis, times your integral. Okay. Now the claim I want to make is that this object, even though these polynomials could be very complicated, this object, if the polynomials have coefficients that are rational functions of the axis, this answer after you sum over everybody, it has to be a rational function of the original variables as well, okay? What's the proof? Well, you can use a little bit of Galois theory to prove it, but it's actually true, okay? That's very good. So now, why am I saying this? I told you that we were able to prove these identities for Park and Taylor amplitudes. These are the MHB amplitudes. But how about the other ones? How about N square MHB? These complicated objects that the more negative helicity particles you put, the more complicated they start to become. But they all satisfy these identities. So my claim is that they can all be written in this form, or at least as a claim, right? But how about number three, the BCJ identity, okay? So the BCJ identity ends up being, or boils down, to these constraints. How about putting this together with BCJ in the following form? How many equations do we have here? We have n equations because we have n variables, right? And these, after you put them in Mathematica and you type together, they become polynomial constraints on the sigmas with coefficients in the Mandelstam variables. How nice is that? That looks exactly what, what I need for the definition of this integral transform or this algebraic transform. So, what if we replace these polynomial constraints by exactly those equations? And using Juju's technique, I'm going to cross this and put my equations here. So it seems pretty good. But the moment you try that, you find that there is a technical disaster 
define a small problem. So let's compute this Jacobian. So what is a Jacobian? So if these are my equations, so let me now call EA the sum over SAB over sigma A minus sigma B. My Jacobian is the following matrix. Okay, so I have to make a matrix of this form. And the matrix, let me call it phi, is a matrix that has the following structure. So everywhere else, everywhere outside the diagonal, the matrix has an entry like this. And on the diagonal, it has I mean, I'm being very lazy here, so I should have written something a little nicer. So say here we have 1, 2 over sigma 1 minus sigma 2 square, 1, 3 over sigma 1 minus sigma 3 square, and so on. And in the diagonal, we just get minus the sum of all the elements here. Okay? And the same thing happens in all the rows. Now, when you take the determinant of this matrix, what do you get? Zero. Darn it. It was so close. I mean, this whole thing, we have worked so beautifully. Now you say, well, maybe it's not such a big problem. Only one null vector, not such a big deal. But then you discover that you have three null vectors. The null vectors are 1, 1, 1, sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma n, and sigma 1 is square, sigma 2 is square, sigma n is square. That's a bit disappointing. So three, there are three linear combinations. So we only have n minus three independent equations, yes. Well, because having one problem is a little better than having three, <laughs> usually, yes. Well, the reason, the reason having one sounded at first better than having three is that people were used to defining, in graph theory, you can define matrices associated with graphs that have precisely core rank one, and there is a notion of the um, when you have a matrix where the sum of all rows and the sum of all columns add up to zero, it's a theorem that you can remove one row and one column and compute the, minor, the determinant of the matrix left over, and that determinant doesn't depend on the row or the column that you remove. That's something very common in graph theory. So if you knew that, of course I didn't know that, but if you knew that, you would say, oh, having one null vector is not such a bad thing. In fact, this matrix satisfies it. The sum of all rows is zero, and the sum of all columns is zero. So indeed, if you remove one row, one row and one column, and you compute the determinant, the answer is independent of the choice of which row and column you chose. Of course, the answer is still zero. <laughs> But don't panic. As it turns out, if you treat this as a bosonic redundancy and you use Fajef Popov procedure, you can show that there is a way to define an object which is the following. You compute the determinant of the matrix where you remove three rows and three columns. Okay? Say the row P, the row Q, and the row R, you remove them, and you remove the columns P, Q, and R, right? And you take from this object here, you take the determinant of the three by three matrix made out of the ones that you chose. So you take the determinant of one, one, sigma P, sigma P square, sigma Q, sigma Q square, sigma R, sigma R square, 
and you call this PQR. Of course, you all know what this determinant is. It's just the product of the differences of the three labels, right? Of the sigmas of the three labels. This is called the van der Monde determinant of these three particles or these three labels. And then, if you have this, and you divide by this, this is independent of the choice of P, Q, and R. Now you would say, well, but we started with n sigmas, m complex variables, and we only have n minus three equations. Sure enough, with this trick, you can define a Jacobian. But what do you do with the other three sigmas? And then you stop and think for a while and think, maybe for a few days, and then keep thinking. And then you realize, well, but we saw in Ashok's lectures, right, that if the sigmas were punctures on a Riemann sphere, right, and a Riemann sphere is a complex manifold, so we should remember to mod out by the SL2C acting on the, on the sphere. And SL2C allows us to fix the value of three punctures. As Ashok said yesterday, the moduli space of a three puncture sphere is trivial. There is only one such thing, so it's rigid, right? So that would mean that if we have n variables, we can fix three of them if we only had SL2C invariance. So BCJ or the BCJ identities are telling us that these transforms or these integrals are supposed to mean integrals over the n puncture sphere, not just any random n-dimensional integrals, okay? And that's a resolution of the puzzle. So once again, the resolution of the puzzle is that any amplitude should have a form or should be written as an integral over the product of n sigmas, but of course, we know we have this redundancy, so I'm going to write it like this. I'm going to divide by the volume of the redundancy, even though it doesn't, doesn't make sense here, but times the part Taylor times Some definition of what I mean by the constraints on the particles, on the sigmas coming from the from these equations, times some integrand that depends on what? Well, it depends on the data, the momentum of the particles. So let me say Kc, the polarization vectors of the particles, and the sigmas. So these were the axes where I started. Okay. So what do I mean by this? Well, we have the definition. We know that if we remove three, part, three labels and multiply by this, we get something that is meaningful. Likewise, we know how to gauge fix this SL to C. In, you're very familiar with that in a string theory, right? So when you're doing three-level computations on the sphere, you gauge fix by removing three of the sigma variables, fixing them to whatever values you like, and multiplying by the van der Monde of those three variables. So what I mean by this is the integral from A different from I, J, K. So those are the three values I'm fixing times the van der Monde of I, J, K. Now, here I take this to mean precisely this, or in other words, I multiply by the van der Monde of PQR and only impose the equations coming from all variables except PQR. time song integrand. Divided by my Park-Taylor factor, which I'm going to write explicitly here. 
okay? So that's a claim. Now, one exercise for you is to show that the twister string formula we wrote down yesterday indeed can be written in this form, okay? Instead of doing that for you, I've decided to study a little bit these equations. So these equations, if that formula is true, and it actually works for any amplitudes, I think these equations that are linking the modular space of the m puncture Riemann sphere to the space of kinematic invariance, they deserve a, new, a name for them. And probably, this is as good as any scattering equations, we can start calling them. Now, I've derived these equations from BCJ identities and so on. But these equations were actually first found by So remember yesterday, Yuji thinks that everything was done after 2000. <laughs> This one is even more surprising. It's 1972. I'm published. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, Peter Goddard sent me a copy. Of course, he was body, he, his body's with <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> don't force me to say anything, I don't know. <laughs> well, they were trying at the time to create some new dual resonance models. Right? But it didn't quite, I mean, I think they wanted to remove the tachyon or something. So they tried different things and then they ended up with something that produced those equations. Okay, so as I said, so if we have the space of kinematic invariance, the equations are connecting them. Well, it's not equal, so maybe, I don't know how to say it. So they are connecting. Oh boy. with the modular space of the M puncture sphere. This was supposed to be a calligraphic M, but something happened. In there. Okay, so let me give you an example in the, so we have 10 more minutes. See that these equations are really special and they know a lot of physics. So in a sense, Riemann knows a lot of physics And the example is consider four particles. So the, the space of kinematic invariance for four particles is the space of these Mandelstam variables subject to the constraint okay. Well, this is what you usually call S, this is what you usually call T, and this is what you usually call U, and this is S plus T plus U equal to zero. Now, let me draw this in the space S and T, okay? So, the space of kinematic invariance is basically R2, okay? So, R2, just a plane, 
as far as I know, doesn't know any physics. There is nothing that the plane knows. Especially, it doesn't know that this line is special. This line is the line when s is equal to zero. And amplitudes are supposed to have a singularity there. But the plane doesn't know that. For the plane, this is just a regular line. This line here is the line t equals zero, where we are also supposed to have a singularity because amplitudes are supposed to factorize. And last but not least is the line u equal to zero. The physical regions for scattering are, of course, these ones. And we know that crossing allows us, by complexifying this space, we can move from one place to the other and so on. But for the time being, all I want to say is that the plane doesn't know anything about why these lines are special. Okay? But let's look at the scattering equations. So we have four particles, but three of the scattering equations are linearly dependent. So we, can, we should be able to do everything with only one of them. So I'm going to choose a scattering equation one. And this is the equation that says that one, two over sigma one minus sigma two, one, three over sigma one minus sigma three plus S one, four, sigma one minus sigma four has to be zero. And now I want to make a good choice of SL to C, so I'm going to set sigma 1 to be, let me check what I want to do, 0, of course, sigma 2, 1, sigma 3, infinity, okay? And sigma 4 is going to be moving around. So, as we know, the modular space is only one dimensional, so I only have sigma four as a, as a variable. Now, in this in the equation, what happens to the equation? Well, after gauge fixing in this form, this drops out. This is not here, this is not here, and this is one. So the equation becomes a very difficult equation. Now you put it in Mathematica, shift enter, and you get that sigma four is equal to minus s over t in our variables there, okay? Now what happens? Well, now we see that if Now, Ashok also explained to us that the modular space has singularities. The modular space of the m puncture sphere has singularities. Now, the modular space of the four puncture sphere, how many singularities does it have? Well, it turns out to have only three singularities, which is when the puncture that we have free to move approaches one of the three that were fixed. So I'd like to draw the space. I mean, people say that the space, the modular space is actually a three puncture sphere. But let me draw it like this. I'm gonna draw M0,3. This is my picture of what it looks like. Of course, this is a three-puncture sphere. At a generic point, we have a sphere just like the one I drew there. The three punctures are happily living, uh, each one of them on their own. But then when we approach one of the singularities, sigma four approaches one of the punctures. So if sigma four goes to zero, that happens when s is equal to zero. If sigma four approaches infinity, that happens when t is equal to zero. And last but not least, if sigma four approaches one, note the minus sign here, that's when u is equal to zero. So somehow, 
the three singularities have been mapped to the three lines here. So the model space knows about all the physical singularities that the amplitude is supposed to have. Moreover, when we approach a singularity, the sphere can be thought of as a splitting into two spheres where we have, say, sigma one and sigma four, sigma two and sigma three. Here we have, I hope you're a little bit familiar with this. What I'm doing here is using a conformal transformation to blow up the sphere that seems to be getting a shrink to zero. There is a new puncture that is being generated. And of course you're familiar with this because Juji kept drawing these pictures all over and over again. So, and here we have another one where we have sigma two and sigma four, and here we have sigma three and sigma four, okay? Thank you. Yes, very good. Okay, now we have five minutes to determine how many solutions these equations have, okay? I already know for four particles we found one solution. Okay. You can sit down and write down the equations for five particles and you will find two solutions. But only two data points are not enough. Any guesses on how many solutions could this thing have? So here is how we're going to study. Let n, n be the number of solutions. So how are we going to determine this number? We're going to use a trick that is gonna be useful later today, I hope, and it's the following. The number of solutions, thinking about this as some intersection in some algebraic variety, some complicated story like that, the number of solutions should not depend or should not jump, given that it's an integer number, should not jump as you deform the parameters smoothly, okay? And if it jumps, it will jump by an infinite number, okay? So if we don't find infinity, we're all fine. We're all, so what are we gonna do? We're going to take particle n to be soft. Well, what that means is that you take the momentum of the particle n, you multiply, you think about it as being some fixed vector times a parameter tau that you're going to take to zero. So let me write the equations. The first n minus one equations and see how they look like. Well, they look like this. So I'm on purpose putting the nth guy at the end, so it's gonna be n a over sigma n minus sigma a equal to zero. But this thing contains kn, and therefore this thing is of order tau, okay? And I'm assuming that tau is very, very, very small. So in fact, in the limit, I get the equations that I will have for a system with n minus one particles. So starting with any solution for a system of, any, of n minus one particles, I should get something that is very close to a solution of this problem, okay? So I have n, n minus one solutions. Which I'm going to denote by the index i. So i runs from one up to n, n minus one. A number that I still don't know. 
So for each of these n, n minus 1 solutions, I can study the last equation. which is the EN equation. And this equation is the sum over SAB, sorry, NA, N minus B, B from one to N minus one. Now I can factor out the tau, okay? So I'm gonna have tau Q dot KB, and this has to be equal to zero, but tau is a common factor. So no matter how small tau is, I can always remove it from here, and this is gonna be a constraint on sigma n. Remember that I'm assuming that I have found already all the other sigmas. So this is a constraint for each one of these solutions. Now, once again, you put this in Mathematica, you type together, and you find that Mathematica will return something that has a denominator of the form sigma n minus sigma bi, i from one to n minus one, and some polynomial in the numerator. Our task is to find the degree of that polynomial. Well, clearly, we started with n minus one factors, right? This is something that should go to infinity as one over sigma n, when sigma n goes to infinity. This has degree n minus one, so this polynomial should start as sigma n to the n minus two power with some coefficient plus lower order. Right, is that clear? Now let's compute this coefficient. This coefficient is nothing but the sum of all these factors. But what is the sum of all these factors? I can put the sum inside, or equivalently take Q outside. By momentum conservation, this thing is Q dot Kn, but it's the same as tau q squared, and q squared is assumed to be null, so this is zero. So the leading term is zero. Now, what I wrote as a lower piece is actually relevant, is actually the most important piece, is m minus three plus lower. So the conclusion is that for each i, For each of the M, M, capital N, M minus one solutions, we have M minus three values of sigma N. And therefore, we have counted how many solutions we have for N particles if we only knew how many solutions are there for M minus one particles. This implies that A N And we know now you know how many solutions are there, right? And I think I'll stop here.